Expected to do an epsilon delta proof on the exam. I haven't decided yet. You might. Ask me again tomorrow. So that's the question, right? I mean, you, you see, this is where we left off yesterday. This allows you to make everything small. Uh, today's song brought to you by Joni Mitchell. I think there are two L's. I, I've rubbed it off now. I think. Uh, 
Anyways, Joni Mitchell, his last name might be spelled incorrectly. Big Yellow Taxi is the name of the song. Wouldn't it depend on delta exactly, as Edwin suggests? It will depend on delta, so we will assume delta is already small. Exactly that. Exactly that. So how large does that get? Right, because remember, we're restricting our attention to stuff near this value. So, so what do we have to work with? We know that x minus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared is less than delta. So let's assume delta is less than or equal to 1 half. Then what? Then this, you know, I mean, we've been using the uh, inequality going the other way. Uh, this is bigger than or equal to either absolute value of x minus 1 or absolute value of, x min of y minus 2. Uh, I I I don't know that the one half is going to do it. We'll see. We'll adjust. So the conclusion is that x minus one in absolute value is less than one half, or and if you add one on both sides. And if you multiply by 2, right, because we are working with 2x plus y here. So, x, so 2x is between 1 and 3. 2x is between 1 and 3. And let's do the same with the y, which I am now slightly worried that the 1 half will not do it, but let's C nonetheless, we have y minus 2, an absolute value, being less than 1 half. So, oh yeah, I think we're fine. So minus 1 half, less than y minus 2, less than 1 half. And if you add 2 to both sides, 3 over 2, less than y, and less than 5 over 2. So you see that y is in here, x is in here. So if you add the two things, right? So if you add the two things, 2x plus y, this is going to be sandwiched between 5 over 2 and 11 over 2. And in fact, it's always positive, so I don't really need the absolute values. So if you cross multiply here, right, if you just concentrate on this part, this is, right, so cross multiply, and you get 1 over 2x plus y less than. 2 over 5. Very nice. Very nice. So this thing this thing is going to be less than 
three quarters times two over five times that square root And there it is. So this is three over 10 times the square root. So if you let, right, because I mean, we did assume this. So now we're gonna let delta be the minimum of either one half or 10 epsilon over three. And so that this is gonna be less than three over 10 times the, time, times whatever. So in fact, since delta is the minimum of the two, then it's at least, it's, it's, it's less than or equal to that. And there you have it. So delta over two, uh, delta being less than or equal to one half was just an assumption, absolutely. And then we cemented it here by making sure that it is less than one half. Uh, where do we get the one half from? That's the thing, right? I mean, you want, you're, you're, you're looking for a bound. So the idea is that you want to, to be close to the point one, two. We don't want to go too far away. So if you're staying close to the point one, two, how, large does this get? But if we had used a different value, and that would be fine as well, your upper bound for this would have been different. Right, in retrospect, I think you could have used one. One would probably have worked, and I, I assume Manwin did just that and you get a different upper bound, and it's all good. Well, I mean, we had assumed delta was less than or equal to one half. So this needs to be taken care of as well. Nicholas is asking, could we use delta to be 10 epsilon over three? The problem with this is if 10 epsilon over three is very large, because, I mean, it could be, right? I mean, because it's epsilon greater than zero given. So we usually assume it to be small, but it doesn't have to be small. And here you made the assumption that delta was less than or equal to one half. So this has to be somehow worked in. And that's how you work it in. You take the minimum of the two. So now you're guaranteed that delta is less than or equal to one half, and it's less than or equal to 10 epsilon over three. So it does two things at once. It's a very nice trick, very useful. There it is. Yes, and what about the square root business? Can't we just say 2x plus y tends to 4? So that for x and y large enough, I mean, for x and y close enough to 1, 2, this would have to, uh, one over that would have to be less than anything bigger than one over four. And it, well, that, that, that's essentially what we're saying, but in the epsilon delta situation. 
how do we get that it's greater than the absolute value? Uh, we, we, we use that in the proof. We use that to get here. If you look back at what we were doing, we had x minus 1 in absolute value. This is the square root of x minus 1 squared. And now I'm going to add... Now I'm gonna add something to this to make it bigger. Something positive, y minus two squared. This is positive, so I'm making the whole thing bigger. Same with the y minus two in absolute value. Here delta is 10 epsilon over three for 10 epsilon over three smaller than one half, exactly that. Is it or or and? Well, it's, it, it's, it's bo both of them are smaller, right? Similarly, Let's move on from this. Let's move on to the idea. I mean, think back to Cal 1, what did we do after limits? We introduced, what if epsilon was large and 10 epsilon over three was bigger than one half, then in that case, delta would be one half. But in any case, in any case, delta would be less than this. And that's all that we need. So, yeah, so after, after the introduction of limits, what did we do? We... introduce the idea of continuity. Can we draw the graph of a function without lifting the pencil from the paper? The idea is the same in higher dimensions. Can you graph it essentially without lifting? I mean, uh, that's just, I mean, really the question is, is everything well behaved? And the definition we had from Cal 1 extends naturally, right? We, we had said that uh, a function is continuous at x equals a if the limit from the left and from the right are equal and equal to f of a. This was the definition of continuity. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. Definition. A function f of x, y is said to be continuous. At the point a, b, if the limit as x, y goes to a, b, is equal to f of a, b. For each plane at z equals k, can we draw the graph of f of x, y, k without lifting the pencil? Does this work? I mean, now you're asking for three dimensions, because of course this is going to extend to higher dimensions, right? I've written down the definition of continuity in R2, but this extends to Rn. You're asking about R3, but I don't think that is sufficient. Nicholas, because 
Uh, there's no guarantee that it's going to be continuous in the Z component. There's no guarantee that everything is going to work nicely with the Z. That's like saying if you fix a Y, as long as it's continuous in the X component, then are you fine? And I don't think you are. I don't think you are because that would just be coming in from two directions when you know that the limit needs to come in from infinitely many directions. So question arises, what functions are continuous? And the answer is pretty much the same thing as in the one dimensional case. If you have polynomials in X and Y, polynomials in X and Y are continuous. Every function of X that was continuous if you compose it with a function of two variables that is continuous, you still get a continuous function. So trigonometric functions in X and Y are going to be continuous, exponentials, logarithms, and so on and so on. Let's take an example. The question is asking us, where is this function continuous? But before we even discuss that, let me point out, point out what? You know cosine of x is continuous. You know square root of x is continuous. And here, 1 plus x minus y is a polynomial in x and y. So it's continuous. And this thing is the composition of all of these three functions. So it's continuous in its domain. Continuous where it's defined. So where is it defined? Right, I mean, you're taking the square root, so that's what's important here. Shouldn't we say continuous? Right, so continuous in its domain. Right here, and this is the only one that's important. This is continuous in its domain, and what is its domain? X bigger than or equal to zero. So that's what's going to define where this function is continuous. And this function is going to be continuous as long as this thing is bigger than or equal to zero. In other words, y less than or equal to 1 plus x. Plus x is this, 
and we want to stop here. This is the domain of this function. And on that domain, the function is continuous because it's a composition of three known continuous functions. Questions here? Do we need to sketch the domain when answering these types of questions? No, you do not. You do not. I'm just saying that, you know, I mean, this concept of continuity extends to higher dimensions via the obvious fashion. Also, let me point out, uh, since the definition rests on a limit, Right? The definition is really a limit. Continuity has a reformulation in the in terms of epsilon delta. So that's I mean that, that that's really how you define continuity using the epsilon delta definition and that extends to higher dimensions as well. All right. We're I think ready to move on. Ready to move on to the idea of differentiation. And let's recall again, let's make a parallel with calculus one. Where you will recall that we define the derivative to be the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. Let me define the partial derivative of f with respect to x, right? Because now we have a function, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to do this in, in two dimensions, right? A function of x and y. So now we have two variables floating around. Let us define, so given a function of two variables, given a function of two variables, we define the partial derivative of f with respect to x denoted df dx so take note of the squiggly d's as opposed to the straight d right straight when you just have a function of one variable squiggly when you have functions of more than one variable so df dx or fx or f1 because x is the first variable or 
sometimes DXF, although not so much in use. Let's undo that. So we define it to be the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h y minus f of x y over h. I mean, you again, as Taha points out. You may have seen this in other courses, especially in physics. It's, it's, it's used all over the place. I mean, the, the partial derivative is of crucial importance, very much as the regular derivative is. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate that people take physics courses perhaps too early as far as I'm concerned. If you if you did up to Cal 4, advanced calculus, before doing uh, physics, I think you would have a much greater understanding of what's going on and you would appreciate it a lot more. All right, but there it is. This is the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Let's analyze what's happening here, right? We are really looking at how the x variable changes, right? This is going to measure the rate of change in the x direction. Nothing is happening to the y. The y is being left alone. The y is being treated as constant. Geometrically, let's draw a picture of what's happening here. If we draw a picture of what's happening, have your function z equals f of x, y, you're fixing a point, and essentially what you're doing is you're, you're cutting this function in the direction of x. Right, so imagine cutting this in the direction of x, and then this partial derivative is going to be the slope of the tangent line at that point, right? Because if you cut, then all you have is the edge, and that's going to be some curve, right? Right, I mean, here, here's your function, and if you cut it, you get this nice, right, just the edge here, that's going to be your function. And f and df dx is the slope of the tangent line at that point, right? Just in the direction of x, because it's just the x that's changing. Similarly, we can talk about the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Or df dy. Or fy. Or f2. Or a few other things. And that is going to be the limit as k goes to zero of f of x, y plus k minus f of x, y over k. I use k here because the book uses k. It's, it's really the same thing if you use h, right? k 
change just a dummy variable here. What does this do? Again, right, you recognize that the X's aren't changing, it's only the Y's. So this is measuring the rate of change in the Y direction. If you were to cut this function in the direction of Y, right? So straight like this, right? You, you, you might get some function. And this, the FDY, measures the rate of change in the y direction. So it would give you the slope of the tangent line, right? Because again, this would give you just a nice curve, just a function. And df dy is the slope of the tangent line in the y direction. Shall we take a few examples to understand what's happening? Let's work out the partial derivative of f with respect to x. We'll do it using the limit definition only to illustrate what's really happening here. So we need to see how the function behaves with respect to x and with res and y now. Exactly, exactly that. Naturally, right? Because you have two variables. So you have two partial derivatives. Derivative of f with respect to x, derivative of f with respect to y. Let's work out the f dx, which by definition is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, y minus f of x, y over h. Much easier, much easier, and you'll see in a moment, Nicholas is saying it seems much easier than using epsilon delta, and it is, and you'll see in a moment that this limit definition, we're very much like we did in Cal 1, where we quickly moved away from it, we're going to move away from it after this example because you'll see exactly what's happening, right? I mean, you kind of get lost in the notation here, but in practice, observe what happens. So, so what's happening here? Everywhere you see an x in your function, you replace with x plus h, the y gets replaced with y. So this is x plus h squared y minus 3y to the 4. Your function is the original. All over h. Let's open up the brackets. And you see that when you open up the brackets, the minus minus becomes a plus, and these things cancel. And we're left with x plus h squared times y minus x squared y over h. Now, you could expand everything and group and, and this and that, 
Let's not do that. Let's be smarter. And let's factor out an a, a y and observe. Observe. If you factor out a y, observe what's happening. Forget this y for a moment. And this, this is what? This limit as h goes to zero of this thing is the definition of the derivative of x squared. So this is the de this is the derivative of x squared, the limit, and then you multiply by y. So this is two x times y. Right? The derivative of x squared, treating y as a constant. Y is fixed here. There's no h's. Y is treated as a constant. Here, the minus 3y to the 4, you had a minus 3y to the 4, and then you subtracted it. They canceled out. Very much like a constant again. So how do you differentiate? a function with respect to x, you treat the y's as constant. The derivative of x squared is 2x, so 2x times this constant. This is a constant, the derivative is 0. Right, that's what this is saying. The y's don't change. The y's are treated as constant. Well, let's repeat by looking at the derivative with respect to y. I'm saying how, how do you differentiate a function with respect to x? How do you take the partial derivative with respect to x? You treat the y's as constant. Derivative of x squared is 2x times this constant, 2xy. Derivative of 3y to the 4 is 0. There are no x's here. Y is treated as constant. And the same is true when you're looking at the FBY. This is the definition. And again, we're looking at how this expression varies when the y's vary. So the x's remain fixed. Right? In this case, everywhere you see an x, it remains. The y's get replaced with y plus k. Minus the original function. Over K. Now again, it's tempting to expand everything, but let's not do that to understand really what's happening. Let us group these two things together and factor out the x squared. So we get y plus k minus y. And let's group these two things together. So again, 
Notice that this x here does not depend on k. This is treated as a constant. And this y plus k minus y over k, you recognize as the derivative of y. Similarly, minus 3y plus k minus minus 3y, wait, minus 3y plus k to the 4 minus minus 3y to the 4 over k, you recognize this as the derivative of minus 3y to the 4. So this is going to be y squared times the derivative of y, which is just 1, minus the derivative, well, or, or plus the derivative of negative 3y to the 4. Negative 3y to the 4 has derivative negative 12y cubed which is just the derivative of this, right? So it's the derivative with respect to y of this function. Observe, observe if you, you're differentiating with respect to y, treat the x as constant, the derivative of y is just one. The derivative of three y to the four is 12 y cubed. The epsilon delta definition is still the only way to get the limit at a certain point. Yes. Yes. Some, some functions can only be done using epsilon delta. So what are we saying? What's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is that when you have a function of two variables or more, Right? I mean, this whole idea extends to higher dimensions. You can differentiate with respect to any of the variable you want. Any of the variables you want. How do you do that? You treat all the other variables as constant. Let's take an example. So we're not going to go back to the definition. I think we've understood what's happening, right? If you want to differentiate with respect to x, you treat the other variables as constant. y is the only other variable here. y is treated as a constant. So you have e to the x times a constant. What's the derivative? The derivative of e to the something is e to the something. And then you differentiate the inside with respect to x. The derivative of xy, this is a constant, like 3. The derivative of 3x would have been 3. The derivative of xy is y. Done. Repeat with the derivative with respect to y. Again, it's still an exponential, so derivative of y e to the something is e to the something. And then you differentiate the inside. Inside with respect to y, x is treated as a constant. The derivative of 7y is 7. The derivative of xy is x. Convinced?
Benjamin is asking an excellent question. Is there a way to represent the derivative with respect to all the derivatives involved, like a com like combine the partial derivatives? An excellent question. Uh, the answer is yes. There are a few ways. The book talks about a total derivative. We're not going to talk about it. Uh, there's also the notion of, of a gradient, which does combine all the partial derivatives there as well. You'll see that in advanced calculus. Or if you've done physics, uh, I know the gradient is very useful there as well. So you might have encountered it there. And that, that combines all the partial derivatives as well. But as far as we're concerned, we're not going to, uh, well, I, I say we're not, but we, yes, we, we, well, maybe, maybe we will. We'll see how, how tomorrow goes. We might talk about something that combines everything there as well. What I'm hinting at is that you can, uh, there's a natural way to use matrices to denote uh, all the partial derivatives. And that becomes very useful in the chain rule. So there's something called the, uh, the Jacobian, really. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you still have DXs and DYs. Right, so I mean, total the total derivative will make use of differentials that I don't really want to get into. But consider this. So here we have a function of two variables, u and v. So we can talk about dw du, where you treat the V's is constant. What is the derivative? V is treated as constant, one over V squared. The derivative of U with respect to U is just one. Similarly, DW DV, U is treated as a constant, so we'll leave that aside. And this is V to the negative two whose derivative is negative two V to the negative three. Easy enough, right? Is everybody comfortable with partial differentiation? Nothing much is happening here. If you're comfortable with the regular derivative, I think it's easy to extend, right? Here you've got a function of two variables. What is the GDX? Well, you've got something cubed. So the derivative is that square times the derivative of the inside, right? Chain rule still kicks in. We're differentiating the inside with respect to x. The derivative of x squared, 2x. The derivative of xy. x and y are independent variables here, right? Y is treated as a constant, the derivative of x is one. There you have it. The 
let me introduce some other notation. Well, I mean, I think I already did, but then I erased it. Let me bring it back. Because the book uses it, so we might as well get accustomed to it. dy, derivative with respect to y. Right, it's again something cubed. So we differentiate the cube times the derivative on the inside. Derivative of x squared with respect to y. There are no y's there. Derivative is zero. x is a constant. Derivative of xy with respect to y is just x. There it is. Too easy? Do we want to do one more? But we'll we'll see. We'll How do we differentiate with respect to x? You see that you've got a quotient here, so quotient rule applies. V u prime plus u v prime all over v squared. Similarly, d2m, the derivative with respect to the second variable, I mean, again, you can use the quotient rule if you want, but this is really e to the x times x squared plus y to the negative 1. There's no y in the numerator. So you don't really need to use the quotient rule, right? e to the x is constant. times the derivative of the inside, which is just one. Thank you. Should have been a minus. It is, absolutely. V u prime minus u v prime over v squared. Absolutely. Thank you. Consider this. And imagine, I mean, you know, let's think about what's really happening here. You could theoretically, I mean, you have a, an equation, one equation in three variables. So you could theoretically solve for one of the variables in terms of the other two, right? This is suggesting that you could possibly isolate z as a function of x and y, at least theoretically. 
if not necessarily in practice. And that being done, we can ask the question, what is DZDX and what is DZDY? And if you think back to Calculus 1, we were doing exactly that, thank you, Xi'an, in the context of implicit differentiation. So this idea of implicit differentiation extends to higher dimensions. Where in this case, you assume that it is theoretically possible to solve for Z as a function of X and Y without explicitly doing so. So it's understood that X and Y are independent variables and that Z depends on both X and Y. So now if you start with your equation, and you differentiate the whole thing with respect to x. Assuming x and y are independent and z depends on both x and y. Let's do it. Differentiate the whole thing with respect to x. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Derivative of y squared, there is no x. y is treated as a constant. The derivative is 0. Derivative of z squared, well, be careful now, right? z is assumed to be a function of x and y. So the derivative is not 0, but rather Differentiate the square, so 2z times the derivative of the inside, which is dz dx, exactly what you're looking for. Minus 2 times the derivative of z with respect to x, which is precisely that, dz dx. Derivative of 4 is 0. And there you have it. Solve for dz dx. You can do that in your head, right? dz dx is minus 2x over 2z minus 2. Or x over 1 minus z. Let's do the same thing. But instead of differentiating with respect to x, let us differentiate with respect to y. Assuming x and y are independent variables. Derivative of x squared is 0. Derivative of y squared, 2y. Derivative of z squared, again, z is a function of both x and y. So we differentiate the square times dz dy. And 
it's easy to see that the ZBY is equal to y over z minus 1. Convinced? How are we doing? What is it? What exactly is implicit differentiation? It's differentiation without explicitly solving for z as a function of x and y. I mean, let's take this example for instance. Can you solve for z as a function of x and y? Right, we had. We have this. Can you isolate z on one side, everything else on the other? That's my question to you. Does everybody have it? It's hard, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's doable there. It's actually doable. Complete the square, thank you, Shia. We're gonna add four to both sides. And this plus four makes this whole thing a perfect square, right? Z minus two squared. And now bring that to the other side. That's 8 minus x squared plus y squared. Take the square root. And z is 2 plus or minus the square root. Very nice. Very nice. So, so now you have z as a function of x and y. So now you can take the derivative with respect to x and the derivative with respect to y. And if you plug in the value of z into here, into the derivatives that you found, the derivatives will coincide. It's a nice exercise to do. We won't do it, but you can check. Right, so here, this question was easy enough that we could actually isolate for z, even though it was hard. In practice, you can actually isolate for z. In a lot of questions though, I mean, if you threw in a line, Then it becomes impossible. But perhaps theoretically, it might still be possible to do so. And the question arises, what about the derivatives? We can still find the derivatives and it's all good. Well, maybe you're asking yourself, who cares about the derivative if we can't even solve for z as a function of x and y? Well, let, let's bring it back to the Calum 1 situation. 
And it's a nice parallel to make. Right? I mean, suppose, suppose you had something of the form uh, x, x squared y plus long y is equal to the 6, right? Uh, solving for y as a function of x, not going to happen. Not going to happen, but you can still work out dy dx. Right? If you differentiate the whole thing with respect to x, under the assumption that y is a function of x, right? So 2xy plus x squared dy dx. And the derivative of this is 1 over y dy dx. And that derivative is zero, bring this to the other side, blah, blah, blah. We see dy dx is minus 2xy over x squared plus 1 over y. And in that same fashion, you can differentiate a second time and a third time and a fourth time. So even though you cannot work out what y is as a function of x, you can find essentially all the derivatives you want. And what are you gonna do with all those derivatives? If you have all the derivatives, Make a series, make a Taylor series. Very nice, Benjamin. If you have all the derivatives, you have the function. If you have all the derivatives, you have the function via Taylor series. Isn't that amazing? That, that's gonna make a very nice midterm question, right? How are you? Questions? Same question, we are looking for dz dx and dz dy, where z is f of x, y, where f of x is a differentiable function. Uh, and when here I was not talking about partial derivatives, right, because this was the one variable calculus one analog, but you bring up the interesting question in that is there a multivariable Taylor series equivalent? And the answer is yes. We're going to see that shortly. Maybe the be maybe tomorrow, time permitting, or probably early next week. All right. 
So consider this. Suppose you have a function of one variable, a differentiable function of one variable, and now you plug in x, y. We are looking for the derivative with respect to x and the derivative with respect to y. So let's differentiate this whole thing with respect to x. So we get dz dx on the left. And here we have a function of x, y. There's no comma here, right? You understand. You understand what's happening. Let's take an example to illustrate if you're not sure. Suppose you have cosine of x. Suppose that's your function. Then f of x, y is going to be cosine of x, y. Everywhere you see an x, you replace with x, y. So how do we differentiate this? Well, how would you differentiate this? You differentiate the function first, you differentiate the cosine, and then you differentiate the inside. So differentiate the function. It's a function of only one variable. So f prime. And then you differentiate the inside with respect to x to get, to get a y. Similarly, dz dy is f prime times the derivative of the inside with respect to y times x. Convinced? How are we doing here? This is the kind of thing you might expect on the midterm. More challenging. Brendan, how are you doing? Nice to, nice to see you. How's your summer coming along? Why do we take f prime? Well, I mean, that, that, that's why I gave you this example, right? How would you differentiate this with respect to x? So what is the derivative of this with respect to x? You would differentiate the cosine to get a negative sign, and then you would differentiate the inside. Right, this negative sign of x, y, that's what the f prime is. A lot of books you say, Bryn, uh, what, uh, any, anything good to uh, suggest? What have you been reading? Questions here? I have not heard about that book. Bitcoin Standard. Exactly that, Edwin, right? F prime of x, y, it, so this is the F prime of x, y. Absolutely. All right. 
Shall we move on then? Question arises naturally. Why stop at the first derivative? Right? When you take the derivative, you get a function, you get a new function. Why not differentiate that as well? I why stop at the first derivative when you can keep going? Right, when you have a function of two variables, you can differentiate with respect to x. Or differentiate with respect to y. But these Yeah, I mean don't get me started on that whole cryptocurrency business. If there's one, well, yeah, to the moon indeed. If there's one cryptocurrency that I never thought would be worth anything, it's Dogecoin, although Garlicoin as well, but yeah, I don't know. Isn't that crazy? To a dollar, yeah. Right, so back to this. If you differentiate a function with respect to x or with respect to y, you get another, you get another, you, you get new functions. Why not differentiate those with respect to x and with respect to y? In other words, if you have the FDX, you may want to differentiate that with respect to X again. Start with X. So let me introduce some notation. This is, I mean, the notation is obvious, right? You have two Ds, so two Ds, and you have two DXs. And you could differentiate that with respect to y. The df dx, you could differentiate with respect to y. So again, notation-wise, d squared f by, in this case, dy dx. Meaning, you differentiate it with respect to x first, and then with respect to y, following this notation. However, however, in the other notation that is in use, if you have fx and you differentiate that with respect to x, well, that's fxx. But if you differentiate that with respect to y, right, which would be According to this, d squared f by dy dx, because of the transformation, if you will, right? I mean, you're, you're applying the derivative to that. Here, sorry. If you differentiate this with respect to y, notation-wise, fxy. Nicholas is right, it really should be with brackets, but that's not the notation. That's not the notation in use. So you, you, you understand it to really mean that, but nobody puts brackets. 
But what I want to bring your attention to is the notation here is the opposite of the notation there. But it makes a lot of sense because this is how you read. You read the X first and then the Y. So, so you differentiate with respect to X first and then Y. And here it's like a composition. So this first and then that one. And then you can keep going, right? D by dx of D by dy of D by dx f or f x y x and so on and so on. There is no stopping. You can differentiate with respect to whatever variables you want. It is not that amazing chalk. I, well, I mean, I say amazing only because I've been told. But, and, and when I say been told, I mean, it, I read it on the internet, but uh, it's, uh, I, I used to be working with Crayola chalk. Very, 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 very dusty. This one much better. This is, what is that? By praying or something. This is it. It says non-toxic, which is very, which is very, uh, what's the opposite of reassuring there? Which is very worrisome, because does that mean other chalks are toxic? I don't know what's happening there. We are asked to find all second partial derivatives. of the function log of ax plus by, where a and b are real numbers. What about whiteboards? Two things. First of all, I, I much prefer chalk, and the whiteboard wasn't coming off very well through the camera. I mean, I, I tried, I tried. I mean, that was, that was the, uh, the first thing I wanted to do and it, it was not good. Maybe I had uh, cheap whiteboards. Yeah. Yeah, so, so chalkboard is, uh, I mean, I, I tried a few things, right? And uh, tried a few cameras, tried a few uh, stream, uh, streaming providers. Uh, I did paint this chalkboard in my house, yes. And yeah, so YouTube was the was the best provider. Even though we don't have this interaction, I think the live chat still works pretty well. And, and I finally got a good camera. So it's it's an acceptable setup, I think. Let's take the partial derivatives here. 
Let's start by the derivative with respect to x or fx. Right, the derivative of ln is one over times the derivative of the inside with respect to x. And this is the only thing that depends on x. There it is. If we repeat, I'm glad to hear the quality is good. I'm always a bit worried. I mean, I see the videos, the videos seem pretty good. But uh, if you're enjoying the quality, then uh, I'm very happy with that. You know, people, even computer science people will tell you that the quality should not be affected on Zoom regardless of how many people there are. But I have found that not to be the case in practice. And... Uh, Zoom was working very well when I was testing with one person. And then when 50 people were coming to the lectures, things were breaking down. And when 200 people were coming to the lectures, I mean, I couldn't even get anything started. It was, it was, it was terrible. I mean, I tried Twitch. Uh, that, that was one of the things. Uh, it wasn't as good as YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube is the way to go. I'm sure you've differentiated with respect to y already, right? The derivative of ln is 1 over times the derivative of the inside with respect to y. There's no y here. The derivative is 0. The derivative of by is just b. Yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. Sometimes there is a little lag. And it was uh, much worse in the uh, fall semester. In the fall semester, after 50 minutes, we would have every day, after 50 minutes, we would have a, 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 a few, a, a bit of lag. Things would freeze for a minute or two. We just have to wait. But now there doesn't seem to be that issue. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Who knows what that was? Yeah. All right. So this is the first partial derivatives. Now let's differentiate the f dx with respect to x. Or again, notationalize the second derivative of f with respect to x. Or using the other notation, fxx, right? In other words, the derivative of this with respect to x. So this is like a ax plus by to the negative 1. So the derivative of that, there's no need to use the quotient rule, right? Negative of that is going to be negative a, ax plus by to the negative 2 times the derivative of the inside with respect to x. So when we say the second derivatives, exactly, I mean, it says all second derivatives, right? So fxx and then... The derivative with respect to y of df dx or d squared f by dy dx or fxy. These, this is all notation for the same thing. Right? So, the, again, can't stress this enough. Understand that... This is not a typo, right? The, you differentiate with respect to x first and then with respect to y. 
So the derivative of this with respect to y, again, minus a, ax plus by to the negative 2 times the derivative of the inside with respect to y times b. Similarly, the derivative with respect to x of df dy or d squared f by dx dy or fyx, again, give what's going on here. The derivative of this. the derivative of the inside times a the inside with respect to x right and finally the derivative with respect to y of this or d squared f by dy squared or f y y is the derivative of that with respect to y, so minus b times the derivative of the inside. Convinced? How are we doing? We want to do one more? to x, what do we have? Minus 2 e to the minus 2x What does fx yx tell us about f, for example? It's a valid question, right? F, X, Y, X. So it's the rate of change with respect to X or the rate of change in the direction of X of this function. Right, so, so first of all, that, that's what it is. And this is the rate of change of Y, of, of, of fx in the direction of y, so, so what? Well, you can imagine, what, right? I mean, what does the rate of change, what, what does the derivative tell us? It, it, it measures the rate of change. So if you have something that changes, you might notice something about this mixed partial derivative. And you have these equations which model how something changes. You have these partial differential equations that model how something changes. And if you want to know what that thing is, 
If you have a partial differential equation, which we'll look at in a moment, then you can really figure out what the function was to begin with. Example, planetary motion may be described using differential equations. We'll see in a moment heat equation, wave equation, how heat propagates in a thin rod. Right, if you were to heat this rod with a fire or a torch, how does heat propagate throughout the rod? This is described using a partial differential equation. And when you solve this partial differential equation, it will give you how hot the rod is at every single point in time. So while we might not understand why this, and, and why, while I don't have a good example to illustrate something with F, F, X, Y, X, you'll see in a moment where something like F, X, X and F, Y, Y are very useful. In fact, the heat equation uh, is essentially this. This is the heat equation for a thin rod on the x-axis. So this is what you have to solve. Yes, yes, of course, differential equations are completely different from this, but they find their way into this course anyways, because what we're doing is we're evaluating partial derivatives. And a nice exercise is to show that a certain function satisfies a given differential equation. Taha is asking, doesn't it depend on the raw material too? Absolutely. This is where the alpha comes in. It depends on the material, the specific heat of that material, and a few other things. Absolutely. We have worked out the first partial derivatives. Let's look at fxx. Differentiate this with respect to x again. And I think it's easy to see for e to the minus 2x goes y. Differentiate this with respect to y. And we get 2 e to the minus 2x sine y. Differentiate this with respect to x. And we get 2 e to the minus 2x sine y. And finally, f y y is minus 2 e to the minus 2x cos y. Let me bring your attention to a nice observation here. Here we had f of x y was actually equal to f of y x here. I mean, it's not immediately obvious, but if you take a step back, right, this is minus AB over that and minus AB over that again. So here, f of xy and f of yx are equal. Here, f of xy and f of yx are equal there as well. The question arises naturally, are they always equal? Well, they're not always equal, but there is a condition for when they are. Theorem 
known as Clairol's theorem. Clairol's theorem says that let D be a disk containing the point containing the point AB. If FXY and FYX are continuous on D, then the mixed partial derivatives at the point AB are equal. So a little more than pure coincidence. If you know continuity of the mixed partials in a disk, then you have equality of those mixed partials. Right, so here the exponential function is continuous. Trigonometric functions are continuous. So, yes, we do have equality of the mixed partials. Let me point out that you can extend Clairaut's theorem immediately. A disk is just a, it's a circle, right, but full, it's a full circle. So you have the point A, B, it's the inside of a, of a circle. So, yeah, so, so, so let me point out that this extends This extends immediately. The radius must be strictly greater than zero. Yes. How do we know both are contained within the disk? It's not both, it's just the point, the point AD. How would we define its radius? It, it doesn't matter as long as there is a disk. And it doesn't even have to be centered at, a, at AB, but of course, without loss of generality, it is. So as long as there exists a disk containing the point AB, for which the partial, the mixed partial derivatives are continuous everywhere inside, then we're good to go. And I wanna point out that this extends immediately to higher degree mixed partial derivatives, right? f of x, y, x versus f of x, x, y, right? Because now your function is going to be f, x, and the mixed partials will be equal as long as these are continuous in the disk. And F, so this one, that one, F of Y, X, X, as well, right? Because now if you look at these two, and F of X, Y is going to be equal to F of Y, X. So then when you differentiate with respect to X at the end as well, so you have all of these mixed partial derivatives being equal if they're continuous in a disk.
Exactly, Taha suggested if f of x, y is not equal to f of y, x, right? If these two things are not equal, then this is because one or both of these were not continuous on a disk. Exactly. Or there wasn't a disk on which both were continuous. Will, be, will we be asked to find higher order partial derivatives or will we be working with second partial derivatives mostly? It's mostly first and second order partial derivatives, but you could be asked for higher derivatives. We are asked to verify Clairaut's theorem. for the function So we want to verify equality of the mixed partial derivatives. So let's find the derivative with respect to x times the derivative of the inside, treating y as constant, right? And the derivative with respect to y, well, now it's a product, right? Both of these depend on y. So product rule kicks in. Differentiate the first one. Times the derivative of the inside, leaving the second one fixed. Plus leave the first one fixed. Differentiate the second one. There we go. How did Clairaut prove that to every function? Well, I mean, that, that's how proofs work, right? I mean, so a real proof is going to probably make use of the epsilon delta definition. And you want to show that both of these limits, because right, the partial derivative is a limit, so you want to show that both of these limits are the same. So, so we have this, and if you differentiate this with respect to y, uxy, it, it does look like a lot of work, yeah, yeah. I mean, needless to say, Claro was a lot smarter than I am. I, well, in fact, I have not seen the proof. Maybe, maybe the proof is, is straightforward. I, 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 have, I highly doubt it, but uh, maybe it just works out nicely. Sometimes things do work out very nicely. Right, I mean, continuity is a pretty strong condition. So maybe everything uh, works out as it should. Things often do, right? If you differentiate this with respect to y, well, now you have three things multiplied together, right, which depend on y. You know what to do. We'll differentiate the first one, leaving the other two fixed. So the derivative of either something is either something times the derivative of the inside with respect to y. 
leaving the other two fixed. Plus, we'll leave the first and third one fixed. We'll differentiate the second one. Plus, we'll leave the first and second one fixed, and we'll differentiate the third one with respect to y. There it is. And let's work out u of yx, the derivative of this thing with respect to x. Here you've got a product, so product rule applies. Let's differentiate the first one, leaving the second one fixed. Plus we'll leave the first one fixed. Differentiate the second one, derivative of x is 1. Sign y is just a constant. And lastly, derivative of e to the xy is e to the xy times the derivative of the inside. Cosine y is just a constant. Do these things agree? First terms are the same. Second terms are the same. Third terms are the same. Beautiful. Questions? Questions on Clairaut's theorem? Partial derivatives? Let's look at a nice application. Definition. Laplace's equation. Is the following why wouldn't the first be uyx and the second uxy? I this I I differentiated this with respect to y. So that that that, that was the important thing that I wanted you to notice in the notation. This is read how you read, right? X, Y, X first and then Y. Derivative with respect to X first and then the derivative with respect to Y. As opposed to this, which is the derivative with respect to X first and then the derivative with respect to Y. So this and this is the same thing. It's just that they're read differently. Right? Here you do x first and then y. Here you do x first and then y. Because here it's, a, it's like a composition. Let me define Laplace's equation. Laplace's equation, d squared u by dx squared plus d squared u by dy squared is equal to zero. Did we take the derivative of the second piece of ui? I want to, I hope we did. I hope we did. We were differentiating ui with respect to x. And I believe this is the derivative of the second. This doesn't depend on x, so this stays constant. The derivative of e to the xy is e to the xy times y.
Laplace's equation, d squared u by dx squared plus d squared u by dy squared is equal to zero. Let me point out that this extends to higher dimensions, right? This is for a function of two variables. If you have three variables, right, uxx plus uyy plus uzz is equal to zero, and so on and so on. This extends to however many variables you have. This is known as Laplace's equation. So if, if your function is only of two variables, this is not there, and you're back there. No, I, I don't know that there's a reason. I don't know that there's a reason we're using u. A lot of books use f. It's all good. Uh, functions functions u which satisfy Laplace's equation Laplace transform, very nice, very nice stuff, but this is easier than the Laplace transform. Here we're just, here I'm not asking you to solve Laplace's equation, I'm only, only going to ask you to verify that these functions satisfy Laplace's, and that's exactly what Number 78 says, determine whether the following are solutions to Laplace's. And it's not the same as a harmonic series either. They share the word harmonic, but that's all they do. So let, let's, let's look at A here. If u is x squared plus y squared, what do we want to do? We want to see if uxx plus uyy is equal to zero. So take the first and second derivatives. ux is 2x, uxx is 2. uy is 2y, uyy is 2. And uxx plus uyy, well that's 2 plus 2, not Zero. Exactly that, Joy. This is what you do in PDEs. You learn how to solve, how to solve these things. You're given a differential equation, a partial differential equation, and you solve it. But before doing PDEs, there's a very nice course called ODEs, Ordinary Differential Equations, where you learn a bunch of nice techniques on how to solve 
ordinary differential equations. Differential equations of just one variable, right? So not none of this thing. And what course is ODs? Uh, I want to say three. Is it three fourteen or three fifteen? Three fifteen sounds about right. Three fifteen. But look, I mean, for, first of all, you're you're, you're saying three fifteen, but if you're serious about math, you need to be doing the honors program. So you need to be doing the honors program. So that that in that case, that would be 325, I believe, for the honors ODs. So if you're if you're serious about math, if you're majoring in math, think about doing the honors program. What's the difference? It's a world of difference. Not for an ODE's course, but for other courses. You, you want to do you want to do the honors program. Uh, analysis and algebra, that's where is honors much harder? It'll depend. It depends. It depends on who's teaching the course. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. I, I would like to say that it probably is not. You get used to it, right? I mean, you, you, you're going to take an honors course versus a non-honors course. You'll, you'll struggle in them regardless. Honors is more proof-based, certainly. The one for engineering students is 263. If you're on the fence about doing honors or not, you want to do the honors. You can always go back. That's the thing. If you're on honors, you can always go back to the majors, but it's difficult to do the opposite. If you do too many majors courses, you're not going to be able to go back to or, or to, to go to spring forward to honors so don't be on the fence do the honors if if it's too much you know take it one semester at a time and you know that that's what uh my fellow students and i did when we were doing the honors course the, the honors program it was always one semester everybody's filled with self-doubt and you're going to think everybody else in the honors program knows what they're doing nobody knows Nobody knows anything. They're all taking it one semester at a time. So relax, do the honors. Uh, I, I don't know what the program restrictions are, but it's, a, I mean, it, I would find it very unfortunate that they would not let you do honors. Well, she is asking about uh, the math, the honors math and physics, and uh, Anwin is actually doing that program as well. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we were talking yesterday and, and she uh, is able to do a lot of, she, she has some leeway, One, uh, wants to do analysis three and four and, uh, And, and, and the algebra as well. And I think that's an excellent background. And that's, that's really where the meat of mathematics is. Well, you know, I mean, I'm only saying that nobody knows anything because I know that you're filled with doubt, but so is everybody else. And, you know, we, I went through that program I know exactly how you're feeling, and my fellow student, uh, you know, my, my, my friends who were doing the program with me, it was all the same thing. You know, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're always unsure, 
analysis is killing you, algebra is killing you, are you going to pass? You know, and uh, you're in the program for this semester, but maybe you'll have to drop out next semester. That's, that's how it is. That's how it is. And, you know, you power through. And uh, you power through and then you, and you do it. Yeah. The math meet. All right. So conclusion, conclusion, is this a solution to Laplace's equation? The answer is no. No, it is not. What about B? x squared minus y squared, differentiate ux is 2x, uxx is 2, uy minus 2y, uyy minus 2. So here uxx plus uyy, what is that? That is 2 minus 2, which is 0, exactly what you wanted. So here, this is a harmonic function. Uh, Yanis is asking about honors applicability to other courses like computer science. I would suspect if given, you know, look, if you're passionate about, about a, a, a topic, about a, uh, a program, you should do the honors. At McGill, if you want to do graduate studies, you have to, or at least in math, you have to do the honors program. You have to do the honors program. And you know, I mean, sure, you're thinking, you might not even be thinking to yourself that you want to do a master's or whatever. But why close that door immediately? Don't close it. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Maybe you're going to find something you enjoy so much that why not do a master's? And if you haven't done the honors, then, I mean, you're closing that door, at least for McGill. So honors is, is the way to go. And I'm going to suggest that that's going to apply for any other program, math or what have you. I'll let you try C, let's not spend any more time on this. Rather, I want to end with a very nice example. Adam is asking if it's better to do honors, even if it means having a lower GPA. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'll be honest. 4.0 GPA in majors math probably does go a long way. But... If people start looking and realizing that you haven't done analysis three, four, algebra three, four, and you know, in fact, when I was an undergraduate student, I even did analysis five and six. So, yeah. 
And, and you know, I mean, it, it, it's going to depend on what you want to do. If you're asking in order to go to a graduate school somewhere else, I mean, uh, the, the people I know who went to, to Harvard to do their PhD or, or Oxford or whatever, the, the good places, all did honors math. So yeah, so I can't I can't really answer that. Uh, what are some fun grad programs though? Well, I mean it depends what uh, fun is for you. But uh, I certainly enjoyed analysis. Okay, let's uh, let's go back to this quickly. We only have a few minutes left. Let's try to work this out. What do I want to do here? I want to show that the mixed partial derivatives are not equal. I want to show that the mixed partial. So this is this is the simplest example where the mixed partial derivatives are not equal. All right. Well, let's start by looking at the derivative with respect to x when uh, x and y are not the origin. So this is going to be the derivative of this with respect to x. So let's work out the derivative of this with respect to x. It's a quotient, so quotient rule applies. And this is going to be the derivative at every point, not the origin, right? Because the function is this at every point, not the origin. The only issue is the origin because of the denominator. So what is the derivative? Uh, quotient rule applies. V u prime, the derivative of this with respect to x, and that is... 3x squared y minus xy cubed minus uv prime times the root of the denominator all over x squared plus y squared. Let's clean that up, expand, what do we get? This is 3x to the 4y minus x squared y cubed plus 3x squared y cubed. Minus y to the 5. Minus. X to the 5. Y. Plus x cubed y cubed. Now 
Would it be enough to prove that the limit of f as x and y goes to zero is not zero? In other words, that the function is not continuous, it would not be sufficient to do that. Remember in Clairaut's theorem, we don't need continuity of the original function. We need continuity of the mixed partials. Moreover, just because the mixed partials are not continuous does not mean, does not automatically mean that the mixed partials are not the same. It's not an if and only if statement. And Benjamin is saying that it should be 2x at the top. 2x, where am I at the top? 2x, 2, 2. Where's the 2x there? Yes, thank you. V u prime all over v squared. So that should be a 2x. So this is 2x to the 4. And this is a 2x squared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so these two combine nicely. And we get an x to the 4y. x squared y cubed, x squared y cubed, so that is 5 minus 1 is 4, minus 1 of the 5, very nice, very nice. And so that's the derivative with respect to x at every point. There is going to be a web work on partial differentiation, absolutely. Uh, I don't know that I want to release it this week since uh, for obvious reasons we have the midterm on Monday. So maybe I'll release it after the midterm. Or would you, pre would you prefer I release it sooner rather than later and still have the due date later? So maybe you can practice the partial differentiation, which is midterm material, right? Yeah, why don't we do that? I'll do that. I'll release it either today or tomorrow, and we can have it due next, at the end of, the, of next week. So that's the partial derivative with respect to x everywhere except at zero. What about at zero? What is the partial derivative with respect to x at zero? Well, here we have no choice but to use the definition, right? The limit definition because I have a piecewise defined function. So by definition, this is the limit as h goes to zero of f of zero plus h zero minus f of zero zero over h. So what do I have here? f of h zero when x is h and y is zero. But when y is zero, the whole numerator is zero. And x is h, so I have zero over h, which is just zero. f of zero, zero is zero, so this is zero. So let's recap. What are we saying? We are saying that fx is this business. This is for x, y, not the origin. And it's zero at the origin. Excellent. And now, what about f, y? What about f, y? And 
And, in, you know, we could calculate Fy, the derivative everywhere, the derivative of this with respect to y everywhere. That is not the origin. And then do it at the origin in a similar fashion. But let's be smart. How does the partial derivative exist if the function cannot take on 0, 0? It can take on 0, 0. At 0, 0, at the origin, it is 0. So piecewise defined function. Nothing, uh, nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with this. It might not have existed. We, we didn't know before we worked it out. But we worked it out here, and the limit exists, and it's 0. So that's the derivative at the origin. What I want to bring to your attention is you could take the derivative with respect to y. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not that long. It's a nice exercise. Go ahead and do it. We're going to be smart, and we're going to notice that if you interchange x and y, what happens? What happens if you interchange x and y? You get y cubed x minus y x cubed over x squared plus y squared. You get negative of what you have. So the derivative with respect to y is going to be negative of this derivative with the x's and y's interchanged. Negative of that derivative with the x's and y's interchanged. not immediate to see, but it's a nice argument. It's a nice argument which cuts our work down by a bit. Not huge here, because you know, I mean, uh, you probably took the derivative with respect to y already, and you probably have that answer. Let's finish it up by looking at f of x, y at the origin. What is the derivative of this at the origin? Well, by definition, again, right, since this is a piecewise defined function, we have to resort back to the limit definition, and this is fx of 0, 0 plus k minus fx of 0, 0 over k. So what is that? Everywhere you see an x, in here you replace with 0, and everywhere you see a y you replace with k. That's 0, that's 0, so we get a minus k. That's 0, and that's k to the 4. Sorry, minus k to the 5. This is 0 all over k, whose limit, this is easily seen to be minus k to the 5. Over k to the 5, this limit is easily seen to be minus 1. And if you do the other one, f of yx at the origin, which is the limit as h goes to 0 of fy of 0 plus h 0 
minus Fy of 0, 0 over H. This is what? Fy of H0. So everywhere you see an X, you replace with H. And everywhere you see Y, you replace with 0. That's gone. That's gone. This is H to the 5 over H squared plus 0 squared. So H to the 4. Fy of 0, 0, 0 all over H, and this is easily seen to be one. And there you have it. Fxy is negative one, Fyx is positive one. This is the simplest example where the mixed partials are not equal. How are we doing? Certainly a good place to end. We'll pick this up again tomorrow. This is where the material for the midterm will end. What, uh, what do you mean, uh, Grisha? This specifically or something in this form? So would this imply that around the origin, exactly right. This cannot contradict Clairaut's theorem. So this must mean that fxy and fyx are not continuous in the disk around the origin. Why do you need the limit definition for piecewise functions? Uh, well, I mean, the limit definition always applies, right? And the problem is that when you differentiated your original function and you got this, this is only valid outside of the origin. The question still arises, what is the derivative at the origin? And if you try to plug in zero into this, you get a zero over zero. Moreover, you wouldn't even be allowed to plug it in because this was valid away from the origin. So you must apply the limit definition here. Nicholas is asking in the same disk, right? Exactly. The midterm will not cover stuff we learn tomorrow, right? This is where it ends. Can't you just differentiate zero? But that's just the value at one point. You know that that's not sufficient. Right, the derivative is the behavior kind of near the point, right? Because the, 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 the derivative is a limit, first and foremost. So you need the behavior of this expression around for, for small values of h and we're we're, we're studying the behavior as h goes to zero, but never reaches it. They can be continuous on disks, but not the same. Well, the, 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 the problem is, if they were continuous on disks that both contain the origin inside, think about what happens now. If there's overlap of disks with the origin inside, then you could draw a smaller disk contained in the intersection of the two. And then they would be continuous there on that disk. So for all piecewise functions, you have to use the limit definition, correct, for the derivative. That's right. All right. Thank you all for coming, folks. We will continue this discussion tomorrow. You guys have a good one.
I will see you then.